Hi. The third part of my uh, Best of Leadership series features some uh, less advertised name but highly successful leaders in their industries, such as uh, Fred Smith from uh, FedEx talking about change, or uh, Mary Barra from GM talking about assuming goodness in people, as well as the technique of uh, reverse mentorship uh, successfully employed at Estee Lauder. You know, the great thing about being able to do two companies in my life is not making the same mistakes. So in the first company, as we grew and went public, we put in, excuse me, a lot of process because we had the idea, if we could just eliminate errors, think how good we can be. And so every time something went wrong, we put in a new process. And we were so proud that we dummy-proofed the system. And what we didn't realize is if you dummy-proof the system, only dummies want to work there. <laughs> And so then the market changed and all of the kind of innovative, crazy thinkers had gone and everybody who was still there was really good about following the rules. But the market had shifted. This was the rise of Java and the internet. And we were unable as a company to adapt. And that's when it hit for me, short-term optimization about being efficient is the death of long-term success and innovation and that we should build a company in Netflix that tolerated some short-term chaos. And we manage right on the edge of chaos. And the value of that is keeping and stimulating the amazing thinkers so when the market shifts, like DVD to streaming or license to expand to original content, we have within Netflix all kinds of original thinkers. And that's the long-term optimization that all of us in organizations want. And so that really fueled uh, the passion behind the, the culture deck, which is why short-term rules and process kill long-term health and innovation. You have a choice of being one of the leaders at a company. Do you want to be a very innovative company, or do you want to be one that is really good at operational execution? How, and you're competing against your counterpart who does the opposite. How many of you want to be very innovative? How many are want to do operational execution? The first group just lost. Operational execution trumps innovation. All the studies coming out, Jim Collins from Good to Great, et cetera, show that. True in our industry as well. Well, one of the things that uh, if you study history, and I love history, and I, I, I like to think I'm a student of it, that is uh, constant uh, is the necessity of change. And uh, I wrote our manager's guide, our management book that we train our folks on many years ago. And I started off with a quote from Marcus Aurelius, who lived 2,000 years ago. Now, we think things were pretty stable in, you know, horses and chariots and wagons and so forth. But in fact, there were a lot of technological innovations that were brought about by the Romans. You know, construction methodologies and uh, geometry uh, innovations and so forth. So I use a quote from Marcus Aurelius that says, the only thing constant about life is change. So I figured if a guy who lived over 2,000 years ago could figure that out, we could and should communicate that to everybody who made up the, the FedEx team, whether it was the original small group or now almost half a million people around the world. So we embrace change, and at the heart of change is innovation. We also had a principle that we would hire the very best people that we could find, independent of whether they're male or female, whatever their ethnic background was, whatever their cultural preferences were, didn't matter. Just so they were the best people that we could find for the jobs that we were trying to hire for. And in fact, I've always told our managers, hire people who are smarter than you. First of all, it's a larger population from which to choose. <laughs> and, oh, I'm glad you got that one. And, uh, and secondly, if you hire people who are smarter than you, they'll take your job away and you'll have to get promoted. So it's the best way to develop your career. 
And in six page memos in lieu of PowerPoints, uh, many, many years ago now, we uh, outlawed PowerPoint presentations at Amazon, which probably the smartest thing we ever did. And uh, it, uh, it's incredibly effective. We replaced them with six page narratively structured memos. And so we have the weirdest meetings at Amazon. When we hire new executives, they are shocked by how we run our meetings because they come in and we all sit around the conference room table, maybe a dozen people in the meeting, and we do half an hour of study hall and all of the executives are just quiet. We just quietly read the six page memo together in the same room, taking margin notes. And then after half an hour, we discuss the memo. And it's so much better, the, before we started doing this, we were doing the more traditional thing, a you know, junior executive comes in, they put a huge amount of effort into developing a PowerPoint presentation, they put the third slide up, and whoever is the most senior executive in the room has already interrupted them, thrown them off their game, they're asking questions about what's going to be presented on slide six, if they would just be quiet for a moment, plus the slides obscure information, because when you take the great thing about memos and, you know, English language memos is they have verbs and sentences and topic sentences and complete paragraphs. And by the way, that is harder for the author, um, but it also forces the author to clarify their own thinking. And so it totally revolutionized the way we do meetings at Amazon, um, and it's been very, very helpful to us. I would recommend to anyone, we're, we're, we're adopting and have almost uh, adopted that practice uh, at Blue Origin as well. There's still a few PowerPoints that sneak in at Blue Origin, but I'm working on it. Oh. I think that energy is always emergent in the company, and I think the best way to do that is show it off. Point it out, celebrate it, and then spread it to the rest of the company. One of my favorite authors is uh, William Gibson, and he has this amazing quote, which is, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And you can apply that to companies too. The future is already in the company, it's just not evenly distributed. So what is our job? What's our job as leaders is to make sure that we distribute evenly the future and that we test it against our theories and we, we build consensus around it. Um, I think there's a natural desire for agility, uh, and it's often blocked um, because either it's not listened to or it's not celebrated, it's not shown off, it's not spread around. And I think it also goes in phases. There will be some phases of a company or organization that just can't handle it, and some phases where you can, and it's okay, uh, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. It's just a, a phase of the company, but should always strive for, I think, looking inwardly and, and also... Um, uh, looking for reconsiderations of ourselves. I, I think the, the, the quality I admire the most is curiosity, just asking that question why, a very simple question to ask but really hard one to answer. And the people who answer, who are comfortable and confident enough in, their, in themselves to say, I don't know, because if they can get to an I don't know, instead of pointing to an authority of, well, this is what they said, this is what the industry wants, this is how they made it, and we can't go any further. If they can get to an I don't know, then there's at least the desire to do the work to figure out why they don't know. Now, a lot of companies say, well, of course, our people are our most, our most valuable asset, our most important asset. And oftentimes, the conception of great policy and great procedure around employment practices is what, is what results from this consciousness. But every once in a while, you see a company that steps back and turns it around and reverses perspective and gains a critical insight. And that critical insight leads to the idea that an employer can work for its employees as much as the other way around. And the example I would give you is Netflix. For those of you who know Netflix, you know that they have a very, very strong culture. That culture is what they've leaned on to really transform the business through a very disrupted time in what they've done. But the insight that they, they, they achieved and then acted on was the idea that families with young, new, new families with young children, with infants, um, need extra support. And it's not just a maternity leave policy that they needed, it was a paternity leave policy as well. And they introduced a paternity leave benefit 
that extends for a year because their insight was the whole family is affected. It's not just uh, the mother in, typical, in a typical uh, circumstance where a newborn is a part of a, a family or where a, a couple may have uh, adopted a child. And that reverse perspective really caught hold and, and really communicated loudly to everyone that was working at Netflix and caught a lot of other attention as well. And I think you all know how successful that culture has been in, in how Netflix has done what they've done. You know, there's that old adage that um, failure is an orphan, but success is, has many, I guess, well-rested fathers. Maybe that's what they had in mind. I think, first of all, assume goodness. Assume if somebody says something or does something that you say, wow, that, that I, I, if I choose to, I can interpret that and I can get really angry about that and I can be, wow, they don't, they don't value a woman or they don't value this or they don't value that. And so my first is to, it's kind of to assess intent. Because sometimes people, we all come from a different background and we have different learning and different perceptions. So it may just be that you know, they have a perception and, and, and it's, not, it's not personal, it's not about me. So I think that often there's an opportunity to have a conversation. Um, you know, there are times where you have to stand up for yourself and go have that conversation that you may think is a little difficult. But, um, and, and so you have to do that. And, and I think having a great relationship with mentors or with your supervisor that you can say, hey, you know, I understand this opportunity is available. Am I in consideration? If not, why not? And sometimes you may think you are, but you get an answer where, you know, you really do need to do some other things. Sometimes it's like, hey, you know what? I didn't think you were interested. So I think you have to be your own advocate, but I think it starts with, um, you know, a lot of times it's, it, there's, a, uh, there's something that you can perceive as negative and it really, it's a conversation, a way of, of really getting to understanding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I want to give one example of the, what we have done on talent. Uh, we have done what we call reverse mentorship. You oh, and yeah. I have talked yeah. about that, Yes, correct? the first time I interviewed you for Career del Sera, you mentioned that. You said yeah. that uh, uh, you hired uh, millennials to be reverse mentors to all the top managers of the company, including you. Including so me. I'm learning. What did you learn? <laughs> I've, I've learned, first of all, I do have a mentor, but we changed, so I don't have the same that we had at that time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I have a reverse well, mentor. How does it work? That, that we meet, first of all, this person is, is a young employee of the company, which is in charge to making the CEO updated on everything is happening that I don't see. Mm -hmm. Now, I have the help of my children on that, but, mm -hmm. but she's helping me a lot as well. And uh, so she sends me mail, she sends me everything she sees in her life. Uh, or we have a meeting every month ah, of about an hour. Month. We meet regularly every month where I listen and I learn and she tells me, or I would go with her in important meetings where I make big decisions on brands, on things, and I want the point of view. Mm -hmm. okay, and yeah. now in this moment we have the 270 most senior uh, manager in the company that have a reverse mentor, mm -hmm. which is under 30. Under 30. And so when you have all this huge influence of the young generation over the senior generation, you accelerate the transformation. Who do you think competitor? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know, we have competed with Tencent here. We competed with uh, Amazon there. We competed. But to me, I think it's too early. Next 30 years, internet is going to, e-commerce is going to change the world. So it's like, uh, I've been saying this to my team since in, when we were in the apartment. When we were in the apartment, I say, guys, in next 10 years, uh, in, in, in the future, Alibaba will be the top 10 websites of the world. And my founders look at me and say, what does 10, number 10 mean? Today we're ranking like a 500 million something at the back. Yeah. But you have to believe it. And then I told the team that internet is like 10,000 meters running, racing. We just finished the first 100 meters yet. Do not think the people beside you is a competitor running for another 3,000 meters, then you know who is a competitor. We are good today. We may not be good if we lose our hope, if we lose our vision. You lose your culture. If we lose our culture and team, we're nothing. Most of the company, they were so good. When Netscape was so good, we never thought it would disappear. Yahoo was good. We never thought like it today. So 
Don't believe you'll be good all the time. Be paranoid. 